Class is now in session. I'm Professor Hockey, and today we're discussing the game between the Sharks and the Coyotes, in which the Sharks lost six to three. Uh, the Sharks' previous meeting against the Coyotes, they also lost. That one was in overtime, also against Darcy Kemper, who was very good in that game tonight. He didn't have to be that great, as the Sharks end up getting uh, not completely outplayed. I don't think this was a dominating victory for the Coyotes, but I would say that by the end of the night, it seemed as though the Coyotes were the better team in general. Uh, first period starts off, and the Coyotes come off with a great start, getting two goals from Kraus and Panic. The Panic one being shorthanded. The Sharks did respond later on with Kevin LeBanc's goal, and from that point on, after those first few minutes where the Coyotes got the first two goals, I felt like the Sharks may have been the better team in the first period. The Coyotes did lay it on shots-wise, but I feel like the main reason for that was because Kraus's goal, which was extremely weak for Dell to let in, I felt like that was sort of the go button, the green light to just start firing shots onto Dell because uh, uh, the coach may have just thought that Dell was weak that night, was struggling that night. And so just fire as many shots, shots as possible and then you might get a nice bounce like Kraus did. And so I felt like that was the Coyotes game plan from about two minutes into the game. And that's what ended up happening for the first as well as the rest of the game. Second period came along and the Coyotes just expanded their lead. Uh, it was... Uh, Fisher's goal that was deflected off the skate of Eric Carlson and then Ekman Larson made it 4-1. Evander Kane pulled it to 4-2 and then in the third period Couture managed to pull it to 4-3 late on a power play but then uh, a controversial series of plays I guess you could say in which uh, Ekman Larson gets a high hit to the head of Timo Meyer, which was not called and then Meyer retaliates with a, a bit of a spear to the back of the leg of Ekman Larson. He goes down, and then that was called basically two seconds later. So certainly a bit of a controversial call, and then Eric Carlson gives it away when the Sharks, for some reason, decide to pull their goalie when they're holding it right behind their own net, shorthanded. So maybe not the best call by DeBoer, especially since there was two minutes left. It wasn't like there was 30 seconds left. But uh, ended up being two empty net goals for the Coyotes, which made it 6-3. As Without the empty nets, it's a 4-3 game, and it ends up being rather close on the scoreboard. First thing I'd like to talk about has to be Aaron Dell, because he's sort of the main topic of this game. Just because of the start that he did have, the terrible goal, maybe the softest goal the Sharks have let in all season. Certainly up there in candidates, because this, this is one you can never really let in. This isn't even just like a perfectly placed shot by Kraus. This is just one that somehow manages to sneak through Arundel. And yet, it seems to be sort of a, a you know, a contentious opinion of whether or not Dell actually had a good game or not. Be but mostly, it just reminds me of the games that Martin Jones had earlier on this season, where the defense basically gave him no help. Jones would let in four goals a game, and it would basically just come to the point where you say, well, the defense wasn't good enough, and so Martin Jones didn't have much of a chance. And so that sort of is the case here for Aaron Dell. He made a couple of nice saves, but the goal against Kraus was weak. I felt like the goal against Ekman, Lar Ekman Larson, while it was screened, I thought it was also relatively weak. The Fisher one was unlucky, and the Panic one I don't think he had much of a chance on because of the breakaway. But just in general, I thought Dell made some nice saves, but he was inconsistent on the night. And so by sort of as a general consensus, I'll say that Dell was okay but he certainly didn't help the Sharks uh, in this one because not the fact that he held the, the, the Sharks in the game when it was, let's say, 4-1. He made a couple of nice saves to keep it 4-1. But he was also a main reason why they fell in a hole earlier on in this game. And you don't want to give up a soft goal like that, a demoralizing goal like that in the first two minutes, especially since it gave the Coyotes the green light to put a ton of shots on net. Next is Burns and Carlson, and for the first time in a long time, it won't be positives about these two players. It'll be negatives. They had, uh, both of them, a really bad night. Eric Carlson, multiple turnovers in his own defensive zone. Of course, the main one, as I talked about, which was the one behind his own net, pressured by Connor Garland, ended up giving the puck straight to Alex Galchenyuk. Uh, multiple other giveaways. He had some trouble handling the puck. Brent Burns did as well. Brent Burns, multiple fanned opportunities, also some giveaways. Uh, a couple times he went for a, a, a his uh, pat Patented butt check. It missed both times. I haven't seen that in a long time from Ben Burns, and I guess that's the reason because it's an extremely risky play to go for. It did not pay off either time he tried to go for it, and so it's not too, it's not really too much of a surprise. These are two defensemen who have been taking on a ton of minutes recently. The Sharks have been playing a good amount of games. I think they have eight and sixteen now. This was the back-to-back -back after a tough game against Pittsburgh, and so. 
at a point you're playing two defensemen 30 minutes a night it's going to come back they're going to end up being tired and in a game against the coyotes they probably sort of let themselves be tired for this one because it really wasn't the game to get up for as it was it was a trap game for both of the defensemen i expect them to recover going into the next one burns and carlson as just defensemen in general are not normally ones to uh you know get into a cold streak but it was a tough game for uh, both of them certainly the final thing to talk about is LeBanc and sort of related to the lineup. Now, a lot has been talked about for the Sharks in this top nine, where they've been running these three very strong lines, as well as a fourth line that's kind of just there. But that the the, the, the top nine is just so solid because the Sharks have been scoring a lot of goals. But there has been sort of one tiny loose screw in this top nine for a while now. And I mentioned it earlier on when the the lines were first set up but it didn't seem like it was going to be too much of an issue until i guess tonight is when the boat decided to make the change uh lukash radil playing on the first line with couture and meyer has seemed to stop really working i mean couture hadn't gotten a point in a very long time before this game i think they said uh his past six games he didn't have a point timo meyer hasn't scored in many many games lukash radil hasn't gotten a point in, in uh hasn't gotten too many points recently as well and so he was always the the potential player who could fall off and return to being maybe a more of a fourth line guy and that could hurt the sharks in the long run now the good news for the sharks is that they do have a player who has the skill set technically to play on a top line and that is kevin lebanc he ends up with three points tonight one of his best games of the season probably since uh maybe even the philadelphia game where he put up four assists back right at the start of the season and so this was a solid game for lebanc he earned a spot on that top line at least for the rest of this one and lebanc is in a very dangerous position at the moment because he's you know as a player who's outside of the top nine that was performing so well he wasn't really someone who's getting a lot of uh credit given towards him and rightfully so he wasn't really doing much and coming up to the end of the season when the sharks are going coming into this cap crunch LeBanc, even as an RFA, who's going to probably command somewhere around like $2 million just based on his point totals, he might not be in the plan in the future for the San Jose Sharks. And since he's an RFA and he can't just go into free agency, I mean, I guess an offer sheet could happen, but it's rare you see on like a low tier RFA. And so it's possible that in this next month coming up to the trade deadline with Wilson announcing that, you know, they might be looking to add at the deadline, LeBanc seems like their most movable asset or at least their most valuable movable asset at this point and so if LeBanc wants to stay on you know a winning team because I'm assuming whatever player the Sharks trade for they're going to be giving back LeBanc to a losing team if LeBanc wants to stay in Teal where he has started his career he's going to have to step it up and he's going to be given an opportunity possibly in the next few games to actually work with Couture and Meyer and I'd say that if he can't get this to work before the All-Star game his time uh, with the Sharks might be limited because you don't really want, Le- or not that you don't want, but it's sort of uh, bad to have LeBanc as a fourth line player because, yeah, he can bring some offense, but he doesn't really have the defensive capabilities, which is another worry because the Sharks' next game is against the Tampa Bay Lightning. And uh, Couture and Meyer are the, the shutdown line to run against someone like Point and Kucherov. And Radil was decent in that position because he's a defensively sound player. LeBanc is probably the worst defensive forward on the Sharks team. So can you afford to put him on that top line? Or will DeBoer be forced to keep Lukash Radil on the top line just so that they can neutralize the top line of the Tampa Bay Lightning? It'll be very interesting to see what the Sharks decide to do with the lineup because it seems as though maybe something should change because this Radil couture meyer line that hasn't really been producing all that much recently was sort of hidden, was sort of masked by the fact that the kane hurdle donskor line was performing exceptionally well, and even the Sorensen-Thornton-Pavelski line was performing decently well. So it's possible that LeBanc could find a spot on that top line, but it's going to be uh, pretty testy just because of the fact that his defensive game is not where it needs to be here, and it's what, maybe third NHL season at this point. He really needs to improve that aspect because he can never play in a top six role if he plans to go up against the other team's top opposition because he's just not good enough in his own zone to warrant his, you know, skill that he brings in the offensive zone that we did see this game. But that will do it for this review. The Sharks will be back in action, as I said, against the Tampa Bay Lightning. Of course, the Sharks, an incredible win versus the Lightning earlier on, actually just a couple weeks ago. They'll now be in Tampa Bay, so they'll be on the road for that one. They'll look to get back into the win column against the league's best team. It's going to be a tough one. Tampa's certainly going to be looking for revenge. I don't expect the, you know, Vasilevsky and the rest of those players to be at the level that they were at in that night. And so 
this might now be the new uh, toughest game of the season for the San Jose Sharks already passing the test of Tampa, Vegas, Pittsburgh. They're coming up against a Tampa Bay team that's going to want some revenge and so it's going to be a real tough one. Definitely tougher than this game even though the Sharks lost so they're going to be having to put up a much better effort if they want to get the two points there. Class dismissed.